Good afternoon, good evening. Not quite sure which we are. We're in that intermediate phase, aren't we? Um, welcome to the University of Birmingham, to the College of Arts and Law, and to Birmingham Law School. I know some of you are from the university, and some of you are family, friends, and colleagues from elsewhere. And we're delighted to have you all with us uh, today for Professor Sylvie Delacroix's inaugural lecture. Now, Sylvie has been with us as a professor for some time um, and has been gradually working towards this piece de resistance, so we're all very much looking forward to it. Uh, her work combines research involving philosophy, ethics, which may or may not be the same thing depending on whether you're talking to a philosopher, uh, law and regulation, um, both to ask and to answer provocative fundamental questions currently in the context of acceptance and use of technology and that what that means for society and for us. Um, today's uh, lecture from Sylvie is going to focus on her new book, Habitual Ethics, uh, which is open access, which means that we can actually all read it um, uh, due to the, the kind sponsorship of the Mozilla Foundation who have made it possible for it to be freely available to all of us. Uh, so we're going to start by hearing from Sylvie and she's going to talk for somewhere around about 25, 30 minutes about her work. After that, we're going to move on to a, to a panel discussion. Uh, I will first come to Professor Heather Widows, who is now Professor of uh, Philosophy at the University of Warwick. Um, previously uh, Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Knowledge Transfer here and the John Ferguson Professor of Global Ethics. And she's going to respond to some of Sylvie's thoughts. And then we'll move on to Professor Chris Barber um, from the school, Baber, sorry, Chris. Um, from, should have been, see, I'm holding my glasses, I'm just not wearing them. Um, from the School of Computer Science and Chair of Pervasive and Ubiquitous Computing. And he's going to give his take, followed by uh, Sylvie responding, and then we'll see if there is time for us to take some questions. So without more f further ado, Sylvie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Okay, well, first I want to say how grateful I am for each of you being here. I mean, it's, it's really special to have you here. Um, I just want to check so that you can all hear me. I don't need to mic up. Great, so that's good. Um, now, of course, as Lisa said, you know, as an inaugural, it comes rather late, yeah? But in many, many ways, I think this lecture is super timed. Um, why? Because, well, this book has been in the making for 10 years or so. It's a rather long time. And this work would be in vain, in my view, if it didn't lead to the kind of conversation I'm hoping we can have after this. So that's why I, I, I really intently chose to have this cross-disciplinary discussion that Heather and Chris have been very kind to accept, to facilitate. And afterwards, I'm also keen to have questions from you guys, so please don't be shy. Um, the more questions, the merrier. So I will keep my own contribution as a result fairly uh, short, um, and there are many points where I will tell you, I will in fact this further if you want in questions, because of course I can't summarize a book in 25 minutes. Um, so I will try to uh, pick the more crunchy bits and um, see whether I can provoke some thoughts um, in you, the audience. Um, so you might have read the abstract for the lecture, uh, which was meant to catch your attention with a provocative question. And the provocative question was, what if the habits that we develop as a result of our technological dependence, what if we become incapable of um, modifying these habits, right? So what if we become effectively the slaves of those habits? Um, what happens then? Now, before I try to unpack that question and its possible answers, I think it's worth taking a step back and consider the wider context within which that question is asked, yeah. And that why the context actually starts with a question too, you'll be glad to hear. Uh, it's, a, it's a very general one. Um, and it starts with this. Can there be such a thing as habitual ethics? Now, one way of answering that question is with an indignant no. There can't be such a thing as habitual ethics. Why? Because for a large strand of moral philosophy, 
mainly the Kantian strand, it's actually uh, completely admitting defeat from the start to say that there can be such thing as habitual ethics. Because on that view, ethics or capacity for ethical agency is precisely what enables us to rise above the habits we pick up along the way, along the way we've been brought up, etc. So, so to say that there can be such thing as habitual ethics is really a contradiction in terms on that view, right? So that's the indignant view. Now, the second view is not indignant, it's blasé. And he will tell you this. Well, of course there can be such a thing as habitual ethics. Because ethics is just a set of evaluative attitudes. Yeah? And so, of course, some of that, these attitudes will become habitual under the weight of repetition. There's nothing really remarkable about the possibility of habitual ethics on that view. So that's kind of the relativist stance which you won't be surprised to hear, I don't have much time for. The third answer is more interesting, and that's where I come closest, right? The third answer is a positive answer, but it's not an of course answer. So it doesn't say, yes, of course, there can be such a thing as habitual ethics. And the reason for that is, um, well, it's important to understand the difference, because because I, I don't answer it as, yes, of course, there can be such a thing as habitual ethics, I actually depart in some ways from the Aristotelian strand, which otherwise I feel very sympathetic for. And so I will try to explain um, why. Um, in many ways, this book, oops, sorry. This book can be read <coughs> um, as a celebration of what I call or pre-reflective intelligence. Yeah. So what is this pre-reflective intelligence? Well, every day, we do myriad intelligent things without really thinking about it, right? We simply do or cope with what our environment throws at us. Now, some of those things are mundane, like maybe this morning I just threw these clothes on without really thinking about it. Was it intelligent? Well, we can debate it. But other things are less mundane. And here I will start with some examples. When for instance, neonatal nurses have been shown to be capable of picking up signs of infection even before blood tests came back positive. And there was a study of this because people couldn't understand what it was that those nurses were tracking, what it was that enabled them <coughs> to kind of feel that there was an infection when we didn't have a model for it. There, was, there were no objective signs, right? And similarly, there were also studies of the ability of farming to sense that a building was about to collapse. And again, people didn't really know what it was that they were seeing, but clearly they were picking up something. But again, we didn't have a model for it. And so the assumption was that these farmen and those neonatal nurses were relying on so-called intelligent intuitions, right? Now, the way we navigate on a daily basis a range of value-loaded <coughs> situations is actually not that dissimilar to what farming and neonatal nurses do. Um, of course, we do deliberate from time to time, some of us more than others. Maybe in universities we might deliberate more than other places. We try anyway. Um, but we get a very distorted understanding of the work involved in living an ethical life if we only focus on those moments of deliberation. Why? Well, what we miss is what uh, Murdoch would call this little piecemeal business that is constitutive of our ethical life. Now, this piecemeal business relies on the construction of intelligent intuitions that are not that dissimilar to the intelligent intuitions that are leveraged by farming and neonatal nurses with a significant um, difference. What is that difference? Well, when our ability to learn from our environment is compromised through a lack of experimentation, these intuitions, those ethically relevant intuitions, are liable to go wrong much quicker than the intuitions that farming and neonatal nurses rely on. Why? You might ask, yeah? why would they go wrong quicker? Well, the answer has to do with the irreducible uncertainty that characterizes genuinely ethical questions. Now, this is a stand I take, of course. Not everybody will say this. Um, but 
in my view, it is not just that we need to keep honing the habits of thought and perception that make certain features of our environment stand out. Yeah? That's true for all sorts of skills, whether it's farming, neonatal nurses, teachers, you name it. It's also that when it comes to ethics, there is, um, well, it's better to say it this way, what this honing process needs to track is not necessarily a clearly articulated goal. So for instance, in the case of nurses, what they're tracking is they have the goal of improving the health of newborns, right? In, in ethics, you don't necessarily know in advance what your goal is, okay? So there is no telling in advance whom it is we need to be attentive to in order to live up to our ethical responsibility. And that uh, entails a need to sustain what I call malleable habits. Yeah? So habits that are plastic enough to, to retain this receptivity to the unacknowledged other, the person who will otherwise go unacknowledged. Right? So this is never easy. It's never easy to have malleable habits. Habits have a way of wanting to rigidify, right? So this is a challenge always, but it becomes particularly difficult when we function in an environment that um, has been optimized according to a machine readable path. Now, I'm not gonna go into that straight away. Um, I'm going to try and give you a brief sense of what happens in the book. Um, it's going to be very brief by necessity. But so I've just talked about the uncertainty that characterizes genuinely ethical questions, right? So that gi gives rise to chapter five, where I try to develop what I call an ethics of attention. And in chapter four, uh, no, in chapter three, sorry, I highlight the challenges inherent in developing such an ethics of attention through the lens of professional practice. Um, it's an interesting lens. Why? Because actually in professional practice you have a mix of, there's a need for skills uh, that are sometimes technical skills, mm -hmm. but also clearly ethical judgment. Um, otherwise you wouldn't have a profession, you would just have an expert service provider. So that's I've argued elsewhere. And so because of this combination of skill and ethical judgment, it's an interesting case where in order to become very, um, uh, well, to develop excellence as a doctor or as a barrister, you will need to actually rely on these intelligent intuitions a lot. But the challenge is to retain this level of receptivity without which you're gonna just see the usual man in the usual place. It's a quote I use a lot in the book, where there's Chesterton, I don't know if you know, Chesterton wrote a beautiful, um, piece of work where he says that lawyers are not particularly stupid, they're not particularly evil, etc. They just get used to it. They just mm -hmm. see the usual person in the usual place. Yeah? And that's tragic. And that quote really inspired a lot of the work in this book. So um, I, I, so chapter three goes through um, the challenge of retaining a, an ethics of attention through professional practice. Now, one of the interesting things here is that it highlights the fact that the difficulty um, inherent in maintaining this degree of malleable habits has the same roots as um, what makes us actually reliant on habits in the first place, right? We all need a stable frame of reference, yeah? In order to know who we are, in order to know our place in the world, we kind of we need habits because they're constitu constitutive of our identity. Yeah? So to some extent, we need that kind of anchor that habits give us. Um, and also in the context of professional practice, especially, we also sometimes need to um, a degree of emotional numbing. Yeah? We can't always be receptive all the time because some of us would just collapse under the weight of emotional labor, right? And so how do we strike a balance then between this, this need for receptivity, which really involves significant emotional labor, and on the other hand, this need for anchoring and some degree of protection, actually. And what I try to highlight in chapter four is the costs of what I call barricading strategies. So some of us, in the face of this emotional labor that's involved in being receptive to the other, 
we prefer to barricade ourselves behind a, curf uh, a carefully curated wall of abstract reasons, effectively. And the cost of those barricading strategies can be felt concretely on a daily basis. Every time you, you encounter a doctor who's just bored and, and just wants you to take uh, uh, information with his form, for instance, you are encountering the cost of this barricading strategy to some extent. But there's also, apart from those concrete costs, there are also abstract costs. Yeah. And those abstract costs um, are in part what led me to write this book. Right? The, the fact that when you think about what stands in the way of us uh, standing up to the demands of a, of a situation, yeah? what, what prevents us from waking up to the fact that something needs to be done? Very often, it's habit. Okay? And because of this, a lot, uh, well, a large strand of moral philosophy has deemed habit to be best left to the province of sociology, effectively. Yeah. It's just a matter of facts for sociologists to study. It's just not something worthy of philosophical attention. And that is a huge mistake, unsurprisingly, in my view. And um, I. I try to challenge uh, that mistake in part by highlighting the fact that as soon as you pay attention to the many ways of having a habit and the large spectrum of habits, you realize that there is no point at which habit suddenly starts or stop. Yeah? So, so there's an emergence condition. So in order to have a habit, the pattern of behavior that underlies it needs to have momentarily escaped your awareness. So that's the emergent condition. But apart from that, go and propose to me one criterion that says, oh, that's an existent condition for a habit. There isn't. Some people have tried automaticity. It doesn't work. We can have habits that we're completely aware of, that we can modify according to our goals, etc. And so this is important to keep in mind. Um, because you basically then end up with a spectrum of the habitual that stretches from unconscious ticks on one hand all the way to purposefully acquired habits that you can modify in light of your goals. Okay, so that's like the most reflective habits. Now, in that way, habits will irreverently bridge whatever gap was meant to exist between facts on one hand and norms or values on the other hand. Now, clearly, I don't believe that such a gap exists, and this is why <laughs> I spend quite a bit of time in chapter one developing what I call a non-reductive um, non naturalism. Okay. Now, I'm not going to unpack this now because I won't have time, but please do ask questions if you're curious. So now I want to move to the second part of the book. I focus on what I call macro factors, so factors that can compromise our pre-reflective agency um, and as a result, our capacity uh, for ongoing social transformations. And I consider two of those factors. The first factors are legal institutions and the design of legal institutions. Now, when um, legal institutions work effectively, they save us a lot of normative labor, right? Um, but the way in which they do so is crucial. So some institutions will be developed or built in a way that allows for more critical um, engagement than others. Okay? And when the opportunity for critical engagement is reduced or compromised, this will lead to a temptation to just basically surrender to habitual frames of thought. And those habitual frames of thought are much more liable to become rigidified than the habits here in this, in this um, scheme. You see that you have a pattern that leads from habits to practices to social rules and legal norms, right? Now, in order to, to generate that movement, you need habits that are alive, so to, so to speak, so that they are not trapped in a pattern of rigidification. And what's really interesting and what hasn't been studied enough, I think, is that depending on the design of legal institutions, some institutions can actually, some institutions can foster or encourage this, this this return movement that says, oh, we're going to change your habits now and change practices which will lead to new legal institutions. But others will just encourage this movement of passivity where we just stand back, enjoy the comforts of demobilized practical reasoning, as, as Raz would say, and, and unfortunately end up in a situation where 
we're stuck in vector nine, where we are basically at the mercy of what Hart would say um, is um, uh, basically nasty shepherds bent on a slaughterhouse ending. That's, that's his phrase, and I, it's also uh, inhabited the writing of this book quite a lot. So that's for legal institutions. I'm not going to spend more time on this. I want to focus on the second set of macro factors, which I refer to as algorithmic habits. So remember the ethics of attention I mentioned earlier and the irreducible uncertainty that characterizes what I call genuine ethical questions. Well, I also explained that to be receptive to the otherwise unacknowledged other um, demands a particularly malleable way of having habits, right? And this is never easy. Now, it becomes near impossible in an environment within which, um, or, or rather when we operate in an environment which has been optimized according to our machine readable past. Yeah? So this past will yield a profile for each of us. And this profile will in turn um, allow a, an inference process about our likely traits and propensities, etc. And the trouble starts when we end up in an environment where, for instance, content and contact recommendations are faithfully reflecting those inferred traits and beliefs. Why is that trouble? Well, it's trouble because it will compromise two key things. The first key thing is imagination. Now, that has been spoken about or written about quite a bit, so I'm not going to delve into that too much. So the, the compromising of imagination we've heard before. But the other factor that will be compromised is this ability to co-construct our environment in a way that allows for experimentation. And that's something that's really bizarrely not been spoken about very much. And I think it has important design implications. So before I get to design interventions, because this is the, the crunchy bits really that where I want debate afterwards, um, I try to recap quickly. Um, I'm still only on 18 minutes, so I have time. Um, so first, there's the premise, um, you know, in all I've been talking about, there's one kind of um, elephant in the room, you could call it like that, or a premise that I haven't articulated, and that's the fact that basically on my view, normative agency, so our capacity to call into questions the way we do things and to call for better ways of doing things, in my view, that capacity cannot be taken for granted. Yeah? It is not a given. It's actually better understood as a capability. What does that mean? Well, once it's a capability, it means that our social environments, social factors can compromise it. And that has actually momentous implications. Why? Well, um, because certainly we have to pay attention to what some people call affordances. So the way our environment is structured. Okay. So, one of the questions we might be asking once you consider normative agency as a capability is this. What if we enjoy the comforts of automated, simplified practical reasoning a bit too much, a bit too long? Right? What started as a kind of normative holiday, this is uh, James, uh, William James who has this expression, I love it. What started as a normative holiday becomes something we are completely unable to put an end to. Why? Because through lack of exercise, just like if you don't go to the gym, well, I'm sorry to say, but your muscles are going to go atrophied. Same with normative muscles, effectively. If you don't uh, have opportunities to exercise them, they will become limp, and you will end up in a situation, um, I love this picture, like these people. This is taken from the Wooly um, cartoon from Pixar. If you haven't seen it, you have to see it. I mean, it's old now, but I, I still love that cartoon. And these are people who end up uh, in outer space, so there's no gravity, and unfortunately they spend too much time sipping, sipping milkshakes and watching movies. And so when they try to stand up, they can't. They just find that they're completely unable to stand up from those little floating chairs. And I think the risk is that if we, we sleepwalk into a, a situation where we increasingly depend on technological tools that are designed so as to make us comfortable, but with no opportunity for critical interaction, we're also going to lose this opportunity to exercise our normative muscles, right? So 
Normative agency is a capability uh, that we take for granted at a peril. Um, the second point, and here again I'm going to go quickly on that because, well, I say it's a distraction, so that's one reason why I'll go quickly on that. A lot of effort has been put when it comes to uh, the harms caused by social media. A lot of people have focused on manipulation as a framework to analyze the harms caused by social media. And I think it's problematic. It's problematic not because it's wrong. I mean, yes, maybe they do manipulate us. In fact, there's evidence that they do. But there's many other tools that manipulate us. I mean, our environment is, is full of stuff that is, that is meant to manipulate us. What I worry about is that if we only focus on manipulation, we actually distract it from a much more insidious threat. And that threat is not a threat to our deliberative agency, like manipulation, but a threat to our, what I call our pre-reflective agency. So it's this kind of pre-reflective intelligence that comes before deliberative agency is mobilized. OK. So this leads me to point three, um, alienation. So when it comes to the factors that can help us retain our capacity to be active participants in change, uh, rather than passive creatures of habit, there are at least two factors worth mentioning. Um, the first one is better known than the second one. Um, imagination, I've already mentioned, is critical. But the second factor, the possibility of ongoing experimentation, is again something that has not been explored uh, to its full potential. So um, when you consider social media platforms and recommended tools of various kinds, you will be struck by the fact that they are unlike most of the habitats within which we are used to functioning in at least one important respect. They do not lend themselves to active co-construction. Right? So that's important. Because normally, to inhabit a structure is to initiate a two-way relationship between us and our habitat that is necessarily uncertain. Yeah? So just as we don't know how I will shape my habitat, normally there's also uncertainty about how that habitat will shape me. Not so with social media platforms. First, we can't shape them. If we think we can, we are fooled. And then they shape us in a way that has very little uncertainty inherent to it. It's actually very calculated. And that transforms fundamentally something actually quite subtle. It's the fact that we learn through experimentation. We learn through an ability to shape our environment. So for that, we need to have a process of, of, um, of failure and, and success. We don't know how it's going to work, right? So I think this, this is really critical, because when you think more carefully about pre-reflective agency, you end up thinking about a learning process, effectively, that never ends. And that learning process, I think, is just compromised through this lack of co-construction. So um, what happens then, uh, I would love the way her Yegi, I don't know if you know her, but she's written um, a, a beautiful book called Alienation. And in that book, she talks of a lack of inner mobility. And I love that expression. Yeah, so as a way of capturing what goes wrong here, she says, you know, you might think you're free. Um, I mean, <laughs> you might have the means to build your future, etc. But actually what you don't have is the prerogative and means to try and shape your habitats in ways that are not predictable. Yeah. And, and, and to try and transform the way we, we actually inhabit our environment. And that's critical. And, and I think this then has consequences in terms of our own understanding of how we can always, again, be different from who we are currently. I think that that is um, a super important dimension. So we then end up instead in an environment that has been unilaterally optimized according to our inferred traits and beliefs. OK, now it's time for me to switch to these concrete types of interventions that I propose. It's not all doom and gloom. I don't like finishing with doom and gloom conclusions. And it's actually something I really um, care about. I find too many philosophers are very good, or lawyers for that matter, are very good at saying all the things that are wrong. Yeah, so 
how we need more regulation for this, that uh, these tools are terrible for that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But do we hear a lot of positive, concrete proposals on how to design better those tools? No, and for a simple reason, partly because I'm a fool. I mean, as soon as you propose concrete things, you expose yourself to easy criticism. Yeah, and computer scientists will tell you you're naive, you haven't understood this, this, and that, and then. Philosophers will say, oh, but you've missed this, this, and that, you know. And so I, I'm quite happy to take that. And actually, I find uh, the traveling involved in talking to various collaborators like that uh, super interesting. So I will focus on two um, concrete interventions that I've actively um, deployed. The first one, ensemble contestability. Now, ensemble contestability, first I should, uh, I should perhaps give a word of apology. I insist on pronouncing ensemble and not ensemble, because I think it sounds terrible in the English way. Um, and frankly, it's a French word. Why, why, why pronounce it in English? Anyway, um, it's called ensemble contestability to flag the fact that here I purposefully borrowed from techniques used by computer scientists to actually prevent a machine learning algorithm from being too biased towards the training data on which it's uh, on the basis of which it's been trained. Right now, these techniques I'm not going to bore you with too many details. But effectively, what happens is you have like one, two, three, four what they call base learners, yeah, which are trained on different data subsets. And there's all sorts of fancy rules about how you distinguish between these data subsets. But what matters here is that you have differently trained algorithms, right? Now, computer scientists, after that, they have fancy ways of solving the disagreement between those base learners. And I don't really care about that, because what I care about is this distinguishing. Um, so what I propose to do is to effectively document how each base learner is trained. Yeah? So you could say, I'll give you a concrete example. It will help. So imagine um, I'm developing a system that's meant to optimize the way uh, online homework is delivered to pupils, right? So we've all been through a pandemic. I mean, I, I mean I've had a child who's had to uh, uh, submit all sorts of online stuff. And you could imagine a system that says, yeah, we're going to optimize what content is delivered to your children according to their learning profile. For instance, we know that children learn differently. And so um, imagine a siblings that are living for some, in some remote location. They can only have remote schooling. And so there's uh, like Sylvie and Paul, right? And Sylvie wants to know why she's being given much easier physics homework than her brother. That's a fairly uh, straightforward question. And so in principle, she should have a way of asking the remote um, home learning provider, why am I getting easier homework than my brother? Right? And currently, answers to this kind of question would give you an answer such as, well, if you hadn't scored uh, in such and such a way in your kind of psychological profile test, you might have been given slightly different content. But also because of your results, like two years ago, we've decided that you fit better in this learning curve or whatever. Right? Does that help Sylvie? Does that help her, empower her? Uh, give her a voice over how her education should be delivered? No, right? It's just telling her that she has a psychological profile that's been deemed to lead to this kind of content. Well, I think we can do better. And so what I propose to do instead is to say, well, let's give Sylvie. Um, we know that the way this online delivery system has been uh, created is just one way. Yeah? And we could, we had actually the, the remote uh, provider had different algorithms at, at its disposal, right? So for instance, you could have an algorithm that was trained only on data from girls only schools, another algorithm that was trained only on data from boys only schools, and then another algorithm that was trained with no, with a characteristic refusal to take into account psychological tests, for instance, right? Now that will give rise to different outputs, yeah? There'll be slightly different models. Now, here what you could do is you could say to Sylvie, here, look at the outputs you would have had from each of these differently trained algorithms. It's much more empowering, because I could be saying, oh, but I much prefer the output from algorithm green, say. Why, why don't you actually rely on algorithm green instead of the yellow one? 
And so then you can start having a debate instead of having just being told that you have the wrong psychological profile. Of it. So that's the kind of stuff that I don't think it's rocket science. I mean, and I'm actually talking to um, a, a few people in Cambridge who think this could be done. One of the difficulties is often actually there's very poor data. We already struggle to have good enough data to train this kind of algorithm properly. Here you, it presupposes having valid uh, data sets to train three or four parallel algorithms, right? But it could be done, and it could be done in part because of the different second intervention I propose. And I'm, I think, am I at 18 minutes? No, no, no. no. You've got about five. Five minutes, yeah, so I'm going to be quick. This is good because I keep data trust for the end, because data trust is the kind of stuff I could speak about forever. And so I will be very quick. Um, yeah. So this is the paper that led to this adventure that has kept me rather busy in the last few years. Um, Data trust, what are data trust? Well, data trust are effectively a legal mechanism that allows groups of people to come together and pull together the rights they have over their data in order to A, obtain better terms and conditions for service providers, B, monitor data sharing agreements, C, uh, obtain insights from their data. So you can have lots of strategies. There is room for all sorts of of uh, data trust with different participatory governance models, different objectives, etc. So in, in short, the idea is to say, let's get rid of the one-size-fits-all approach to data governance, and let's complement much-needed top-down regulation with bottom-up empowerment infrastructure. Yeah. So here the idea is to say, we've relied too long on top-down regulation without really paying attention uh, to the fact that actually when it comes to data, means of collective empowerment is, are crucial. Data is, is kind of uh, not that valuable if it's only considered individually. Once it's considered on a collective scale, it becomes a different game. And legal systems are actually very poorly equipped when it comes to rights for groups. And so this is one of the things that we've been trying to remedy through this data trust um, framework. I, get, I, I don't want to spend too much time on that. What I want to emphasize why does it relate to habit ethics? Well, it relates to habit ethics because actually it's a way of beating the habit of passivity that we've been encouraged to adopt through the current data governance framework. A lot of us are used to clicking away pop-up consent windows that ask us if we consent to our data being collected for this or that. So we've been encouraged to adopt what is really an insidious, um, I think, habit of passivity, when actually data is I think not just a political uh, a tool for economic empowerment, it's also increasingly a tool for political empowerment. It's something that can actually allow currently disenfranchised communities to acquire voice. And that's important too. We have to move away from the idea that data is always about privacy. For a lot of people, it's critical that their voice is heard through their data. And so data trust are, are basically a way of saying uh, we have to allow for a way of learning new modes of participation when it comes uh, to data governance. A and they are live now. It's not just theory. Through this data trust initiative, we've launched the first three pilots. Um, and um, yeah, well, if you're interested, just click datatrust.uk. So that's it. I've, I've taken you through quite a long story. Um, I've told you about normative agency how it should be deemed a capability, not a given. I've told you about the fact that the analysis of the harms of social media in terms of manipulation really act as a distraction um, in the sense that we focused way too much on our deliberative autonomy and we've not paid attention or not enough attention to our non-deliberative pre-reflective intelligence that can also be compromised uh, by social media. And then point three, I've talked a little bit about alienation, how basically if, if you really dig down, what you find is that we, we are kind of uh, digging our own grave in some ways with the way we are, we are designing those online environments because we are ridding ourselves of the means and capabilities uh, to build different futures, to always be different from who we are already. And so I've talked briefly um, about those, first, those remedies, those interventions 
Ensemble contestability uh, is one that is alive and that I'm actively trying to implement um, as a concrete thing. And then the second thing is bottom-up data trust. Again, that's live too, and that's all about learning uh, new habits of participation, effectively. So I think that's it. I'm going to leave to Heather and Chris um, uh, an opportunity to, to say what, what thoughts this triggered, and uh, then I hope we can have a discussion. Thank you.
not happen overnight. And that is something we have almost forgotten, and habitual ethics is beyond timely. We increasingly live in a world where all knowledge is seen as how-to knowledge. How do we make clean energy? How do we stop the spread of infectious disease? And forget the human questions that lie behind these of what kind of world we're making to live in. If we forget and then simply chase the race for technical fixes, there's a question about what we will be fixing. Will we be trying to live lives within the gaps left between technology in spaces which make it impossible to be ethical and impossible to see the other? So Sylvie tells us that we are some way along this path. She says, and I quote again, what if these ubiquitous connection devices have compromised our physical ability to the noise of an accident? Think earpods. What if the feeling of hyper yet virtual connectedness leaves us numb to actual events occurring outside our connected circles? This is already happening. What was once sci-fi is now real, and for those a lot younger than I am, it's all they have ever known. The tech shapes who we are, leaves us more atomised and disconnected, and yet, in a strange way, more reliant on others for our sense of self, strips our inner as well as makes us less aware of the other. If we want to stop this, we need to rediscover the responsiveness to the other. And that's as much for ourselves as it is for others, and it's not just about individuals. In fact, it's fundamentally not. It's about how we live together and grow together. And so we say we need a degree of civic vigilance that is increasingly discouraged in our current form of lives. But it's combining the individual with the social. And overall, um, she thinks we're forgetting how to exercise our ethical muscles. And we're not noticing that these muscles are atrophying. Without ethics, we become some kind of version of narcissistic sociopaths, and we lack that human spark. Humanity is not fixed. A future humanity could be wholly different and disconnected from current humanity. So we need to think about how we rebuild this, recognise this, teach it to our children, value it in our professional lives, reward and cherish it. So habitual ethics is a call to arms, and it doesn't stop there. It then goes on to think about how we actually do that. So I'm the philosopher, I kind of stop at the, yeah, yeah, we need to do something about this problem. Whereas um, Sylvie goes on in a very brave way to propose um, new and different ways that we might begin to address it. So all I want to say is thank you, Sylvie, for this amazing book. Thank you. So, Chris, I think this is where you can come. Yes, um, so I'm from the School of Computer Science, but my my interests, I suppose, that align with, with Sylvie's work is, is to do with understanding habits and the environment in which we operate. What you didn't quite, perhaps didn't get from, from Sylvie's presentation is that each of the building blocks that she's presenting for her argument is a radical departure from conventional wisdom in, across <coughs> a number of different disciplines. So if we think about how we, how we perform everyday actions, um, I, I tend to put sensors onto people and then analyze the data and try and work out what they're doing. But one of the areas that I'm most interested in is understanding skill and dexterity. And for me, a dexterous person is somebody who is not only able to, to do something well, but can do that thing adaptively. They can change what they're doing. You can train somebody to be competent, but if you go beyond competence, you have to have the ability to be, to be flexible. Uh, and to physically respond to the environment in which you find yourself. And so, so many of the points that Sylvie makes about affordance and about the environment resonate with, with just that understanding. Most of what I've been looking at are physical activities rather than mental activities, but I don't think you can divorce the two. I think that there, there is an embodied engagement which, which allows you to, to interact with the environment around you in ways that feel correct. And perhaps the correctness and, uh, allows that to feel normal, which is both sensible, I think, because it requires less cognitive attention to what you're doing, but also deeply worrying. Because as, as that normal, dexterous response to the environment becomes comfortable, then you stop questioning it. And so the risk of habit becomes one of, of, of the inability to recognize that there is another way of doing things. If we think about training a robot to do something, one way of doing that is to get the robot to have a camera to film the environment around it and to try and interpret everything in the environment through clever image processing, which takes a huge amount of computational power. 
But what the robot really needs to do is to work out what are the bits of the environment it needs to attend to in order to achieve what it's supposed to do. And there are different schools of thought in psychology which compare, which can be compared in the same sort of way. So schools of thought in psychology that says you build a really complex mental picture of the environment before you do anything. And other schools of thought that just say the world is there, respond to it. <coughs> and I think part of, part of Sylvie's argument is that the world is there, just respond to it, but you have to decide what is that world. And as you become more habituated to certain behaviours, <coughs> what you lose is the ability perhaps to imagine the world other than it is in front of you. And this question of imagination becomes really important, both in terms of, in terms of ethical arguments, but also in terms of robotics. That, that a robot that just does one thing really well might be okay for spraying cars in a factory, but you probably wouldn't want it in your house, or, or caring for your children, or your elderly relatives, or as a nurse. Because what it, what it would be able to do would be to, to deal with a sort of normal-sized child, <laughs> behaving in a normal sort of way, um, and responding to normal sort of interactions. And there's no such thing as any of those. So the, the ability of technology to adapt requires, first of all, the ability of technology to imagine a different world. And one way in which you might do that is, is to allow humans to understand the imagination of technology. What is it that the technology believes it's dealing with? And what do you believe that you can do to help change its belief or influence belief? And so this idea of, of I'll say ensembles, <laughs> Re reasoning about different versions of reality becomes, I think, exciting as a proposition, difficult to do, because once you've trained a machine learning algorithm or an artificial intelligence to respond to the world that it sees, it may not be able to have another world that it doesn't see. That's certainly not in ways that we do. So how do you get that dialogue between, between people and the technologies that they interact with and how do you allow people or give people the permission to question and challenge the technologies that they interact with through counterfactual reasoning, through, through alternative versions of the world, through, through different modes of questioning. And we're, we are very far from an, having a, a computer science or an artificial intelligence that would support that type of interaction. At the moment what we have, what we are, are um, if you like, the recipients of the wisdom of AI but because we don't understand quite what it's doing, we're not able to, to undermine that, challenge that, contest that. And that then further, I suppose, creates this notion that the, the technology world that we, that we inhabit becomes habitual because we don't, know, we don't know otherwise. We don't know an alternative. And I think by raising the possibility that there could be alternatives and then pointing out that we accept that, there may be risks to the to the way in which we relate to each other and to our environment, I think Sylvie's going to be really provocative. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we've got about 10 minutes left. Shall we go straight to questions? Yeah, or do you want to respond? We should go straight to questions. Okay. Anybody, do you want to ask a question? Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Sylvie, for, um, for allowing me to, to exercise an intellectual muscle that's pretty dormant throughout my work day. There's so much richness in what you've described. But as you were talking, and as I was trying to digest what you were saying and trying to understand it in a very superficial way, I became more and more alarmed. So please help me to um, see if my alarm is misguided or is genuine in the sense that, as I understand it, what you've described and the, the processes that you've described and the world as it's evolving and the direction of travel it's going in, um, um, we uh, the word imagination came up, and what I picture is um, a convergence of our, our tram lines in terms of discovery because there are going to be self-inflicted inhibitions to curiosity rather than imagination. So it's it's in that pre-intelligence phase, possibly as you were describing, um, which which <coughs> to my mind starts before imagination kicks in. So curiosity and the diminishing and inhibition of curiosity through this hab habit forming stuff means that the volume of discovery as we look ages into the future 
are going to be limited, and, so, and, and that's quite alarming. So that was one thing, and the other thing I would um, maybe ask about is human augmentation, um, as opposed to robots being out there. It's how that, uh, as that those enhancements as we see, are going to. Well, how do you see that impacting in the framework that you create? Thank you. Well, so first, on curiosity, um, the reason I haven't used the word curiosity is that it's typically, it tends to be used in a way that's less embodied than when you talk about, say, the possibility of experimentation through, um, through touching, to, through undoing, redoing. So curiosity has a bit of an abstract Kind of note to it. So you can use, I mean, you can have a baby who's, uh, who's curious, of course, and who will be uh, acting on her curiosity through, through very concrete interactions. But we adults, when we use the word curiosity, it's often a bit intellectualist. And that's why I, I steered away from it, because for me, uh, it's, it's actually critical to, to resist that tendency to always apprehend the risks and ethical challenges from an intellectualist perspective, as if what really matters is to preserve the autonomy of our judgment, the autonomy of our deliberative um, thinking, um, without really paying attention to the fact that our intelligence is very much embodied. And, and I love what Chris had to say, because, um, yeah, I mean, I, I am an optimist by nature. So I, I do, I, I love to think that we're just in, in kind of the prehistoric stages of machine learning design, etc. And, and it, hopefully, there's still time to insist on working together. This will really take cross-disciplinary collaborations to, to, to design much more interactive types of machine learning methodologies. Yeah, it's not easy. Um, and it's interesting because I was reviewing, I was searching for, at some point it was a, a sexy topic, it was interactive machine learning. Yeah, so there were, was literature published like 10 years or 12 years ago. And then you keep searching and there's, no, there's nothing. So I asked a colleague in the Alan Training Institute, I said, why is there nothing on interactive machine learning? Or well, at least I can't see anything recent. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, it's because we've gone for the lower, lower hanging fruit. You know, there's like easier thing we can do that doesn't involve interactive types of machine learning. So, so that's kind of for, for when we're better at the simpler stuff. So I said, oh, maybe if that's true, then maybe there's hope, you know, but I might be wrong. This was a quick, a quick uh, on the side kind of conversation, not very serious conversation. But anyway, I hope this, this answers your question about augmentation as well. I, I think it's just that we lack imagination as well in the way we design those tools effectively. And, um, and in a university like this, this is a place where we can, we can and ought to work on solutions and different approaches to this. Thank you. Another question? Yes. Um, very interesting, thank you very much. Um, one thing that occurred to me as you were talking was we should be able to observe empirically that people who have grown up in the kinds of environments that worry you are worse people than people who didn't. But the reverse, if anything, seems to me to be the case. If I think about my own school days and compare them to my daughter's, it seems to me that her generation is kinder, more tolerant of difference, than mine was at the same age. So does that disconfirm your hypothesis? Oh, I, 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 I'm glad to say I don't have a model of good or bad people. Yes, so I don't have like a, a scale I can measure people on badness or goodness terms. So what I would say is, is all about our capacity for learning and our capacity for growing and making things different again from what they are. Yeah, so this transformative capacity. So it's kind of detached from judgments as to kindness or, or openness or tolerance, which are all very important virtues, don't get me wrong. But what I really focus on is, is kind of one step removed, is saying quite independently of what we deem uh, worthy of, of prioritizing when we educate our children, there's one thing that we ought to all agree on, is that we need to retain a capacity to always, again, make things different from what they are. Yes, it's a, and, and I feel like once that's compromised, we are really in a boiling frog scenario. Time for one more question, if anybody's got one. Yes, 
Um, so thank you, fascinating. I have a very mundane, you know, concrete question about the relationship between um, algorithms and what you talked about, the empowerment of, or the potential um, empowering, uh, put, oh, sorry, the empowering potential of data and, you know, the way that it can be used to empower communities, especially vulnerable and this drive for data protection, right? And the design of data protection laws, the way that they are called, you know, focus on the individuals, uh, and the huge drive. So this clicking on the agreements that we use for sharing, it's also about, you know, to some extent about data protection. And we just lose the, you know, lose interest in, in reading. I mean, I don't think anyone reads them. Um, including myself, right? Um, and, and I wondered whether, you know, I mean, I'm sure you've done work on this uh, as well, the, the relationship between the data trust and then the data protection laws and how they interact. Sorry, a very legalistic question. No, but this is a good question. I mean, it they interact in many ways. First, data trust wouldn't be possible without the GDPR policies. So without data rights, there's nothing to be put in the trust. Because that's one thing that often people misunderstand is that a data trust doesn't presuppose that we pool data. We, what we need to pool is data rights. Data can remain on the servers of Facebook, Google, or whatever. What we can do is then basically then ask an intermediary, a data trustee, to exercise those rights on our behalf and potentially say exercise portability rights of one million people and say to Amazon, either you talk to us and we agree terms of conditions that govern the collection of all data, and so people in our data trust will sign into Amazon via their data trust, so we reverse the, the direction of consent. So that's a scenario that's not going to happen tomorrow, but it's a possible scenario, right? So this is a scenario that very much leverages rights granted by the non regulation. Um, but at the same time, the, if, if data trusts do see light of day, and they are actually arguably, which is amazing, um, I think this is going to lead to another dynamic where you're going to have competition between, there's going to be room for all sorts of stuff, good and ugly, yeah? And so there's going to be, for instance, a race to the bottom, potentially. If data trusts compete for the most number of people who join them, there may be a race for the highest financial returns for their data. And then what do we end up with? Potentially a nightmare scenario where you have, yeah, race to the bottom. And so this might, in turn, call for new stringent regulation that tells you there are some kinds of data that just can't be monetized under any circumstances. So there's going to be a dynamic relationship between basically those bottom-up employment infrastructure, where we have a lot to learn, a lot we don't know, and top-down regulation, which always comes too late, but which is absolutely critical in terms of building bottom-up employment infrastructure. So although we started a few minutes late, we are finishing a couple of minutes late, but I want to give you the opportunity, if there's anything final you want to say, this is your inaugural lecture, you are most welcome to do so, Sylvia, before we conclude. No, I'm just super grateful, I find these conversations, uh, I live for these, you know, it, it, this is what, what makes uh, my job uh, passionate, fascinating, and so thank you, thank you to you both, and thank you to you for your questions, and I hope uh, we can continue with our drink, there's a uh, reception just and thank you on behalf of Birmingham Law School as well, and many congratulations on delivering your inaugural lecture. So thank you to you both. Thank you.